I've got a little bit of a dual meaning in the title here. Um, this is trustworthy software in the real world. Um, in one sense, because I'm talking about software that interacts with the real world, that interacts with physical systems. Um, but in another sense, uh, a lot of what I'm talking about here is, is tools for, for improving software quality that uh, have been kind of restricted to academia. And so I want to talk about how you can actually apply these kinds of tools in real, um, real projects uh, and not just in the you know, ivory tower sort of world. Um, I work for Galois. Uh, our, our mission is to uh, engineer trustworthiness in critical systems. And so I'm going to talk a little bit first about uh, what trustworthiness means. But to explain that, I have to talk about uh, this notion of trust, that we have software that we are implicitly trusting, you know, in an uh, uh, ECG monitor in a hospital or something, where the software is controlling systems where privacy or money or lives or something important is at stake. Um, so some examples. Well, you know, I, a bunch of you are probably here because I mentioned quadcopters in the, the talk description. Quadcopters are a thing that we're trusting. Um, if a quadcopter falls out of the sky and hits somebody, it's, it's a pretty heavy piece of equipment. This is not, this is not light. And uh, even just falling out of the sky is a, a dangerous thing to have it do. Um, if someone is maliciously attacking it, then you can do even worse things. So we're trusting those. Uh, we're trusting ATMs, right? We care about whether the ATM actually gives us the right amount of money and takes the right amount out of our, our accounts. Or uh, if it's in our favor, then the bank cares. Somebody cares. <laughs> uh, we're trusting spacecraft, right? We've got a, a rover sitting there on Mars right now. Uh, here's it taking a selfie. Um, that uh, when this rover uh, entered the Martian atmosphere, it was, I don't remember how many light minutes away. The, uh, the folks here on Earth could not talk to it until after it had already landed. Um, they, I think they call it like 17 minutes of terror of uh, having, having no idea what has happened to the spacecraft and hoping that once the, the radio signal actually reaches Earth, it will tell us, yeah, I landed fine, thanks. Um, but meanwhile, the thing's got to be completely autonomous. So the software is super critical here. Uh, cars. We have, you know, hundreds of, uh, of computers in every car. We're trusting those things. Uh, this is a, a screenshot from a 60 Minutes segment in February that, uh, that we contributed some to, um, in which uh, at this particular moment, Leslie Stahl has discovered that her brakes aren't working because somebody with a laptop on the other side of the parking lot disabled them. Um, Medical devices, pacemakers or something. If you haven't seen Karen Sandler's uh, OSCON keynote from uh, 2011, I think it was, about why it was so important to her that, uh, that the pacemaker she had to get installed to keep her alive, um, that she couldn't get the source code to it. She couldn't inspect it in any way. You know, Open source matters for this stuff, but open source, I'm going to argue, isn't enough. Um, we also need tools and techniques um, systems in place that are going to actually ensure that your pacemaker is going to actually keep your heart working. So that's, you know, we're, we're trusting this software. Um, the software is trustworthy if that trust is actually justified, which it often isn't, uh, as in the case of the 1996 launch of the Ariane 5, which is everyone's favorite uh, software engineering failure, where an uh, integer overflow led to the, uh, the spacecraft having to self-destruct. And you get this very pretty and very expensive fireworks show. Um, let's talk a little bit about what kinds of, um, of trustworthiness we might have. I'm going to call this an assurance case. Um, so one kind of assurance case might be that, uh, that, you know, I know the programmer who wrote this code. They usually do good work. It's probably fine. That's, that's a certain level of assurance. Um, you might go for a slightly better level of assurance. There are some unit tests, and they pass. You know, that's great. Maybe even you've uh, checked the, the coverage metrics on your unit tests, and you found that uh, the unit tests have high branch coverage, and they still pass. You know, that's, that's reassuring. 
Um, if you keep going down this line, you might eventually get to the point where we spent years formally proving that everything is correct. And that is really awesome if you can do that. Most of us can't do that. So let's talk about what falls in between uh, these, these uh, somewhat extremes. Um, but on that particular uh, example of spending years proving things correct, here's the state of the art in, uh, in full-on formal verification of software. Um, our, our partners at NICTA in Australia have this uh, microkernel called SEL4. It's uh, about 9,000 lines of C code implementing a very small operating system. Um, and they've proved it correct all the way down to the compiled ARM assembly, which is an amazing, you know, fantastic result. You can, you can go ahead and run this on the hardware that it supports anyway. Um, and, and have these really strong guarantees about exactly what it will do and what it won't do. But it took them 11 person years to verify that their C implementation actually matched uh, their formal specification. And then they spent another two person years verifying that the, the generated assembly matched the formal specification. Which, by the way, is cool because now you don't care if your compiler has bugs. But again, years and years of effort to verify 9,000 lines of source code. Some tiny thing. You compare it to the Linux kernel, it is 15 million lines. There's just no way. Um, they estimate uh, that given the tools that they developed over the course of doing this, that they could reproduce this kind of work at a cost of about $127 per line of code, which for 9,000 lines is a bit over a million dollars. Um, that's actually not a terrible price as you know, commercial software development efforts go. Um, it's, it, you could argue, um, and I would argue, that uh, this is actually pretty cheap if you compare to the cost of uh, doing something less formal and having to maintain it over time, all that extra work later on trying to, trying to fix all the bugs that you didn't catch the first time. But still, uh, many of us don't have a million dollars to write 9,000 lines of code. So what else can we do? Let's talk a little bit about um, some tools that you could use now. And I'm going to get back to quadcopters, I promise. <laughs> um, here's a, a nice paper that I, I recommend checking out. Um, Gerard Holtzman at uh, NASA JPL uh, wrote this paper, The Power of Ten, Rules for Developing Safety Critical Code. And I'm going to call out just a few of his uh, ten rules. Um, things like restrict to simple control flow constructs. So uh, in this kind of setting, don't use recursion, don't use go to, things like that. These are, these are simple rules um, that, are, that are coding standards. Uh, make sure that every loop you know the maximum number of times a loop can run. Uh, don't use dynamic memory allocation after you've initialized the system. Uh, that's going to be one that's, that's a bit of a head scratcher for many people. But, um, but in particularly in the embedded sort of uh, safety critical world, um, this, is, this is probably really good advice. Um, and you know, compile with warnings enabled. Uh, this, is, this is kind of standard CS101 advice. Um, use one or more source code analyzers. They, they, they don't really get quite get to in CS101 usually, but um, these are pretty common kinds of advice. This is the sort of thing you might expect to find from coding standards. Um, but what's really important about these particular 10 rules is that they are all machine checkable rules. So uh, what Gerard did was arrange that as part of the continuous integration process on the, uh, the Mars Curiosity rover, for instance, um, every night all of these rules were checked over all of the source code. Um, because coding standards are not interesting unless you can actually enforce them. <laughs> So coding standards, that's, that's one thing that you might do. That's one piece that might be a, a useful, useful part of an assurance case. But it's not all we can do. Um, another thing that you might do is runtime countermeasures. So for example, uh, just using the assert statement in whatever language you're working in uh, to, to check that something that you assumed was true really is when you're actually running the code. Um, that's, that's probably a good idea. You might want that. Um, some other things, you know, turning on OS features like address space layout randomization so that if a bug is exploited, the uh, attacker will have a harder time actually doing any damage. Um, or turning on compiler features like stack protection 
and uh, the address sanitizer that will, if you have a buffer overrun, it will stop your program and tell you, hey, look, something bad has happened. I'm stopping now so no further damage is done. This kind of fail-stop behavior is, um, is really useful uh, in, um, in most systems. Uh, there's also developer tools like Valgrind. Um, definitely recommend this. It's really easy to use. You build your program as normal, and then you run it under Valgrind. And Valgrind tells you, hey, look, you have a buffer overrun here. You have a memory leak there. Um, maybe you have a data race between threads there. Uh, it's super helpful for finding bugs. Um, the problem is that all of these sorts of these runtime countermeasures are like closing the barn door after the horse has already kicked down the, uh, the falling apart wall. Um, <laughs> so they're great. You should use them. Um, but they're not very satisfying. So what else can we do? Um, here's one that is, it is a really stupid idea. Let's try throwing random data at the program and see if it crashes. Like, this should not work. This should not help, right? But it turns out <laughs> that um, if you just leave a fuzz tester running on your code for a couple of days, it's going to find so many bugs. And it's going to find bugs that you as a human would never have caught in writing unit tests. Um, so some particular tools that you might want to look at, uh, American Fuzzy Lop, if you have a, a system where um, where you're feeding it a, a file and it does something with that file, um, American Fuzzy Lop will wind up generating a file that is valid input for a program and then generating another file that crashes your program. <laughs> you can write like a file that contains the word hello and give it a JPEG extension and feed it to a JPEG decoder and you will wind up with a valid JPEG. Uh, it won't be a very interesting looking JPEG, but it, it will be valid and then you will find crashes. <laughs> Um, it, it's just an amazing, amazingly stupid, uh, amazingly effective technique. There's also uh, Trinity is another example for fuzzing Linux system calls. There, there are a variety of things in this space. So this is a great plan. I definitely recommend trying that. Um, it found, uh, using uh, AFL, they found that even GNU strings, which all it's supposed to do is find you stuff that looks like text in the middle of a binary program, GNU strings had exploitable bugs. <laughs> um, so what else can we do? There's um, this class of tools that are symbolic execution tools. Um, for example, the CLI LLVM execution engine. It's kind of like a principled version of fuzz testing. The idea is that you've got something that understands the structure of your program. It's looking at all your if statements, all your while loops. And it's, uh, it finds that, all right, if I give you this input, you'll follow this path through the program's control flow. So let's try to change the input to find a different path to the control flow. And it does uh, directed things to, to try to explore as many paths as possible. So you wind up with um, effectively an automatically generated white box unit test or integration test suite um, that has the maximum possible code coverage. <laughs> um, it's a really powerful technique. There are some other things you can do with it that I'll get to in a moment. Um, CLI works on, uh, on stuff that has, that's compiled using LLVM. Uh, there are similar tools like for Python or for Java. You can find all sorts of things under uh, symbolic execution or symbolic simulators. Um, another thing you can do, um, back to the idea of, uh, of randomizing things. Let's write down uh, a property that should be true for all inputs. So let's say you've got a function that reverses a list. Let's, uh, it, it ought to be true that if you reverse the list and then you reverse it again, you get back the original list. That's, that's something that should be true no matter what, what the contents of the list are. Um, here's another thing you might write down. Let's say uh, I, I want to assert that reversing the list gives back the original list. Uh, that should be true for some lists, but not all of them. So what... Um, randomized property testing does is it generates, say, 100 tests, 100 random lists, and checks this property on each one of them. And, uh, and for the first property, it says, yeah, sure. For all the lists I tried, and I just generated them randomly, um, the property held. But for this other property, 
I tried four tests and quickly found that the list 1, 0 uh, is not the same if you reverse it. You know, big shock, right? <laughs> um, so uh, so I've, I've put on the slide the Haskell implementation of this because it was the, the first, but, um, but this kind of randomized property testing is available in basically every programming language that you're likely to be working in. Um, I, I haven't heard of a, a you know, white space or be funge or something implementation, but I guess I wouldn't be surprised. Um, so this is great. This is uh, the, the property testing approach. It's often easier to write down the properties than it is to write unit tests. And the randomization thing um, is typically more effective than what humans will write as, uh, for unit tests. So this, so this is a, a, another useful tool in the toolbox. But that's not all we can do. Um, given the same concept of let's write down a property that ought to hold true for all possible inputs to this piece of code, we can actually prove correct, you know, prove that that property holds on that piece of code. So for example, um, if I want to assert that uh, taking x and bit shifting it left by two bits is always the same as multiplying x by four. I can, I can ask something like, in this case, SBV, to prove that, and it comes back and says, yes, that is true. And then I can ask it to prove a different thing, um, that x shifted left by 2 is equal to 2 times x. And that's not true. And it will come back and say, no, that is wrong. Here is a value of x for which that does not hold. So it can actually tell you not only uh, that the property didn't apply, but why it didn't apply. So this is super useful. Um, but you may be looking at this and saying, but I'm not programming in Haskell. Who's programming in Haskell? Well, all right. So if you're programming in C, for instance, there's, uh, there's Frama C, which lets you do the same sort of thing. You write a specially formatted comment. Um, in this case, we're going to say that the max function um, implemented this way needs to have this property hold true. And the Frama C tooling can go and automatically check. Um, for, for many useful properties, the tools can automatically verify that the property holds. Uh, so you write down in this sort of combination of, uh, or cross between pure C and LaTeX or something, um, what property you want to have apply, and it checks it for you. Um, it can't automatically check all properties. Things get complicated sometimes. Sometimes you ask it to prove, prove for Matt's last theorem, and it says no. But, but uh, if you want to, you can, uh, you can manually prove the hard properties with the help of a theorem prover. So, um, so this is a really cool way to do things. Um, it, it, it's, it's something that you can do to part of your program, maybe just the really hard parts. Um, prove only the properties you really care about right at the moment. Um, and there's some neat things that you get when you can start to actually rely on these sorts of proofs. You get, for instance, that you can eliminate runtime checks. You know, because you wrote down the property and you checked that it holds everywhere, um, you know that this argument is always in the range of 0 to 3. You don't have to assert that anymore. You don't have to waste uh, time at runtime checking that. You don't have to waste uh, brain space looking through those asserts and saying, oh, I, I don't care about that assert. It's always fine. You can just delete the damn assert <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and know that your code is still safe. Um, also, this kind of thing of writing down these properties with your code, it's great documentation. So someone looking at your code can go look at that and say, oh, I see. That's, that's what this is supposed to do. Um, but documentation is even better if you can actually have it machine checked so that it doesn't get out of date. Uh, because that's the big problem with you know, documentation comments, right? Is they get out of date. So this is, this is a great kind of documentation. Now it has some disadvantages, right? Um, for one thing, writing down all of the right properties is hard, uh, both in terms of um, figuring out what it is that you meant to say. That can be hard. Um, managing to say it correctly in a way the computer understands, that could be hard. 
Um, and in fact, some of these sorts of problems are hard enough that, uh, that we recently released a, uh, a game, uh, Monster Proof, that you could go try, that is a, um, a crowdsourced property finding game. Um, just, you know, let's find out. Maybe, maybe if, we, uh, if we make this fun, maybe people will be able to actually, uh, actually do this stuff. Um, the other problem is that I'm not aware of very many tools yet that uh, integrate this sort of property annotation with whatever language you're actually working in. Um, I showed the example of FramSC, uh, so that's great for C code. Um, there's NASA's Java Pathfinder, uh, which lets you do Java annotations that contain the same sort of pre and post condition information. Um, and I don't actually know of others. There probably are, but I don't know about them. So, you know, this is something, something it's a place where um, you know more more work is needed, right? But it's a really powerful approach given the uh, given the option. Here's another interesting thing. Let's say you've got some, uh, some Java program, and somewhere in the middle of it, it needed to find the first set bit in a 32-bit word. So you wrote down the obvious loop. Let's try for each of the 32 bits. Let's check whether that bit is set. And if so, we'll return that, that bit index. Um, and if none of the bits were set, we'll just return zero. Uh, so you've gone through, you've done your development, you're happy with this, but then you discover that it's on the hot path. You've, you've done some profiling, and this is slow. Um, and so you decide, well, you know, maybe I didn't want to be working in Java for this. Maybe I want to do this in C. And maybe I want to um, use a, a more efficient bit twiddling version. And this doesn't look anything like that, right? This, this looks incomprehensible until you stare at it a while. Um, and maybe even then. <laughs> so now I'd like to be able to ask the question, well, are these two functions, which are in two different languages and have two different algorithms, do they actually compute the same thing? Uh, so a thing that, that uh, Galois released a few weeks ago is we have this uh, software analysis workbench that lets you write down a little script that says, I want to load this Java class and extract the reference implementation method out of it. And I want to load the LLVM module of the uh, compiled from the C code and extract the, uh, the optimized implementation from that. And I want to write, write down, again, a property which says that for all possible arguments that I could give this function, if I evaluate the Java reference implementation on that argument, I will get the same answer as if I evaluate the C optimized implementation on this function. And then I can say, prove it. And it will go and sit there and chug a little bit and say, hey, that's true. Um, so this is an amazing kind of tool. Uh, this is putting that notion of symbolic execution together with, um, with property proofs. Uh, you can find another example of this same kind of idea in the paper on CLI, which I mentioned earlier, uh, where they demonstrated uh, or they, they compared uh, GNU Core Utils uh, utilities against BusyBox versions of the same commands, um, and were able to show uh, either bugs in them or show that they were equivalent. So this is a super powerful kind of approach. Um, I do have to give the disclaimer that. Uh, where I believe everything else in this talk is fully open source. Um, SAW is BSD licensed for the, the core, but is um, free for non-commercial use for the uh, symbolic evaluators for LLVM and Java. Um, so in the interest of full disclosure. <laughs> so that's, that's a really cool kind of approach. Um, but let me come back to quadcopters, which is what many of you are probably really here for. So quadcopters are an example of what the, uh, the buzzword calls cyber physical systems. And so these are physical systems that are controlled by software. Um, in other words, they're software vulnerabilities with physical consequences. <laughs> so here's an example of a quadcopter that's just fallen several hundred feet, right? You, you just shatter the thing. And it's, uh, it's good that nobody happened to be st standing under it at the time. Um, but on the other hand, there's clearly a giant uh, commercial opportunity for these quadcopters. I mean, Amazon wants to use them to deliver all packages under five pounds. Um, and 
7-Elevens are selling quadcopters next to the booze. <sighs> um, so what's the state of the art in quadcopter security? Well, <sighs> as of last month, there's a quadcopter that shipped with a, uh, thank you, with a um, Android app that has hard-coded into it the root password for the quadcopter. Is that the actual root password? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I don't actually want to name it, but you can find it. Uh, so you know, on the bright side, at least they're using crypto, right? This is SSH, and although it's a Wi-Fi link, at least they turned on WPA. You know, they're trying. It's cute. Um, other commercial UAVs are uh, unencrypted and unauthenticated. So you know, this is better than average. Um, so this is where the, uh, the project that uh, my coworker Pat here and, and I and, and others have been working on. Uh, DARPA is, uh, is running this Hackums program for, um, among other things, uh, we're, we're demonstrating a high assurance quadcopter autopilot. Uh, other pieces of the, the air team um, demonstrating the same technology on a, a larger scale is the Boeing unmanned little bird. Um, I've forgotten if I had more to say on these slides. I'll go on. <laughs> so, uh, so I want to point out here, these are embedded systems. They're tough environments. Um, so one example of what's tough about this is that you have to do error-prone ma manual memory management because uh, in an embedded setting, you don't, have, uh, you don't have time for garbage collection. It's, uh, it's going to break your real-time guarantees. Um, you have a tiny amount of RAM. Uh, we've got uh, 192 kilobytes of RAM on, on this quadcopter, and that's relatively big for an embedded system, frankly. Um, so there's no room for a high-level language runtime, let alone an operating system like Linux. It's just, it's just not going to happen. Um, and I talked earlier about the, um, the runtime countermeasures, you know, having your assert statements that stop the program so that, uh, so that the bad thing can't continue happening. Well, a fail stop watchdog could kill someone just as much as having the bug trigger could in this sort of setting. Um, so you actually really need to get this, this, this stuff right. Um, so we need better tools that let us have confidence in these critical embedded systems. So I'm not going to suggest that the stuff I'm about to show you is the way you should go build code today. But, um, but it's the stuff we've been building, and uh, it may resemble stuff that you'll be using in the future. We'll find out, right? Uh, predicting the future is always hard. But uh, so one piece that we've built is a language called Ivory. It's a safe subset of C. Um, in particular, it's safe in the sense that it completely eliminates buffer overruns. You cannot write buffer overruns or use after free bugs um, unless you integrate native C code, at which point, of course, obviously all bets are off. But, um, but as long as you're, you're within the realm of code that you've written in Ivory, you are completely safe from these entire classes of bugs. Um, part of the reason you're safe from use after free bugs is that we don't support dynamic memory allocation, so there is no free. But uh, you know, it's, the, the point still stands. <laughs> um, I'd, I'd point out you should compare Rust here, which is uh, if, if this is what you care about, Rust is probably the language you want to be using today. Um, it's got a, a very nice type system. I'm very impressed with the, the language design stuff they've done. But, um, but this is not the only thing that, uh, that Ivory does. Ivory also integrates this property checking stuff that I've been talking about. So I can write down uh, the max function um, and include with it, uh, in, right in line in the code, here are the properties that I care about. I want to know that the return value is at least as big as both of the arguments and that it exactly matches one of the, at least one of the arguments. And then Ivory lets you use these, um, these property annotated function definitions and do both the quick check style randomized testing and the Framacy style um, formal proofs, both automatically. Uh, so it will just go out and, and whichever one you, you ask for, it will go out and, and do it and tell you, yes, this is fine, or no, here's a counterexample. 
another thing that, uh, that Ivory is cool for, um, and this is a big deal from my point of view, is metaprogramming. So you know, in C, you've got the C preprocessor. It lets you do a little bit, not very much. It's intentionally limited. Um, in Ivory, uh, Ivory is actually an uh, embedded uh, domain-specific language embedded in Haskell. And that means that we can use Haskell to do any of the, um, any sort of computation we want at compile time. Um, so some examples of that. Um, like 30 lines of code generating 30,000 lines of C uh, for a tedious um, pile of math, an extended common filter if you're familiar with that particular bit of, uh, of sensor fusion control theory kind of stuff. Um, this is a pain to write. Um, and we can just generate it. So the output is efficient C. Um, it's running nicely on our tiny little embedded CPU. Um, the input is an I don't have to think very hard specification of this is the filter I want. And it, it just computes it at compile time. Another example, um, here's a thing that comes up a lot in uh, like embedded microcontroller kind of, uh, kind of projects. You're writing a serial driver, say, and uh, your particular serial peripheral has this pile of clock dividers and PLLs that you, you need to configure just the right parameters or the baud rate that it's going to produce is not going to be the baud rate you needed. Um, and often these are complicated enough that you basically want to try a whole bunch of different possible configurations for all of these, these components. Um, until you find one that's close enough to the speed you actually wanted. <laughs> so let's just do the combinatorial search at compile time. I don't care if it takes a minute to, to figure out what the right parameters are. The output is, here are the values that you're going to write into these registers. Just compile that into your program and ship it. <laughs> and, um, and because you can do this in code uh, as just part of your build process, you can have a reusable serial driver that uh, you tell it, all right, that was a great set of parameters for that project, but now I'm working on a different board with a different uh, clock speed, and I need a different baud rate. Compute it for this one. And you're reusing the same code. So we've, we've got great code reuse here, right? This is, um, this is the ultimate in don't repeat yourself, is being able to have the computer do the repeating yourself for you. <laughs> and a, a third example of this, um, that I'll go into a little more detail on here, is gluing independent components together at compile time. So if I've got a component that's my common filter, and I've got another component that's my driver for the serial port, and all these other different components I want to put together, um, when I'm writing the common filter, I don't want to have to be thinking about any of the, other, any of the rest of the system. I want to just think about, here's the inputs and outputs for the common filter. Um, so we have another tool called Tower, um, which is our, uh, our composition framework. And so it's, it's static um, in the sense that uh, you know at compile time all of the threads, all the resources, um, all the code that's going to go into it, which means that you can check properties about this code. Um, it's Real time, when used on a suitable real time operating system, uh, we support a couple of them. Uh, we also can, can generate code on, to, to run these components on Linux, although at that point it's not real time. Um, it's concurrent, so, uh, so these components, you write them as if they are all running at the same time. And the only way that they interact with each other is by sending messages to each other. So this is a really simple. Uh, model to work with for con concurrency um, and lets you get, get that correct. Uh, it's a component framework in that um, when you write a component, you can then drop it into many different projects and reuse it without changing the code. Um, but this is a degree of reusability that, uh, that we don't typically get in um, in other sorts of component frameworks, because you can parameterize it at the level of uh, of dropping, uh, of you can parameterize it at the level of what code is running inside the component. Um, you should ask me afterwards what that means if you're curious. Um, 
a final piece. Uh, this, again, um, back to the SEL4 microkernel that our partners at, at NICTA built. Um, SEL4 gives you provable process isolation. So um, because they've, they've done the correctness proofs, they can guarantee that if you have two processes running under SEL4 and you haven't specified that they should be able to communicate with each other, they can't communicate with each other. Um, which is an amazing thing to be able to say uh, if you've studied you know, side channel attacks and these sorts of things. And it's got some limits. But um, So on the Hackums program, uh, part of what DARPA is funding is uh, for independent red teams to break everything we build. Their job is to come through and poke holes in all of the work we do. Um, so we're going we're gonna, to uh, give ourselves a little bit of a challenge. We're going to say, here, red team, you can have root on a Linux VM running under SEL4. And we're going to claim that even if you have root on that VM, you cannot break out of that VM. Uh, you cannot go affect other things on the same system or on, on its network connections or anything, uh, except in the specific ways that we've allowed you to. If they can't break out of that VM, we win. We are uh, pretty confident. <laughs> we're getting pretty close to question time. Yeah. And this is uh, one of my last slides. I'm, I'm more or less on time. Um, so all that goes together uh, into the Smack and Pilot project. This is BSD licensed on GitHub. Um, here is the, the standard completely inscrutable diagram of, uh, of key parts of, of the architecture. Uh, I want to point out we've got something like 10,000 lines of, of driver code written right now in something like 8,000 lines of, uh, of autopilot application software. That's generating 40,000 lines of C. Um, you could describe that as being 20,000 lines of code we didn't have to write. Um, so some conclusions here. Um, it'd be really nice if we could stop having buffer overruns at least, please. <laughs> um, there's, there are tools for, for at least helping you with that. Please use them. <laughs> Um, there's this great quote from Edgar Dijkstra. Uh, I think this is back in the 60s that he said this. Program testing can be used to show the presence of bugs, but never to show their absence. So testing is just not enough. It's not sufficient. It's particularly not sufficient if you actually care about whether your software works. If you don't care, then fine. Just, just test or just deploy it. I don't care. But, but if you want it to work, testing is not enough. Um, in fact, it turns out that random flailing as in fuzz testing, is more effective than human testing. <laughs> I mean, the Klee paper is looking at GNU core utils, which is, uh, the, the, at the time they were talking about it, having 15 years of being some of the best tested software in the open, so open source world. And they continued to find bugs in it. Um, I also want to point out formal proofs. They've gotten a bit of a bad name because uh, academics really like them and don't really think about the, uh, the details. But, um, but they're becoming more automated. They're becoming more integrated in, uh, in development processes. So you might look for, uh, for these more automated formal proofs uh, to be part of, uh, part of your workflow in the future. Uh, I'm also obligated to point out that if any of this sounds like stuff that you want to work on, uh, we're hiring. <laughs> and with that, are there any questions? Thank you all.